It's a top 10 list. These are the 10 most impactful neutral cards from the Year of the Mammoth, as we're about to rotate into the Year of the Dragon, and also the top impactful card from each class. The Madman. Let's begin with number 10, Devil Soar Egg. This card is the ultimate enabler of the Death Rattle Hunter deck, and there was very few openings more scary than Coin Devil Soar Egg, and then you would pretty much know that the opponent was gonna follow up with Terra Scale Stalker, and then you were gonna have a bad time. And then the egg was going to get like eaten by cubes, and then like play deaded, and it was just insane. Number 9! Vicious Fledgling has been Terror, which can swing games on turn 3, or on turn 2 with the coin. You could turn 1, unnerfed, innervate Vicious Fledgling, and that did happen. I think Vicious Fledgling is a card that the Hearthstone team now will look back as a lesson from the past, in terms of don't create a card that will potentially snowball the game starting turn 3. Number 8. The Lich King is a powerful, imposing figure, the main villain of Knights of the Frozen Throne, and he's like the big guy on this list, 8 mana, 8-8, eight, eight, with a huge Ysera level of card power. Uh, you saw him in pretty much all the control decks as an ultimate value card, who could double as ultimate value as well as stop aggro due to having taunt. Number 7, Stonehill Defender. This little guy saw so much play across not just control decks, which is where it naturally looks like it would belong, but also in odd decks, just because it was so much value that even a kind of aggressive deck, Odd Paladin, ran it. Because it does discover some incredible taunts, and of course, uh, class cards show up more often, so Stonehill Defender was pretty much always discovering Tyrion or Terran. But yeah, Stonehill Defender was just such a good tool for control decks to stop aggro early game, but also get a big value card in the end. And if you were up against aggro, you could choose like a small taunt instead of the big, maybe like Lich King type card. For example, getting stuff like Tar Creeper or Rotten Apple Bomb. Which brings us to number six Tar Creeper. This little guy looked like he was going to be the answer in control decks against aggro decks, stops their aggression early with a strong 3 mana 3-5 three, taunt effectively. Uh, 1 mana discount on Senjin, Shield Master turns out to be all the difference. This card always saw a lot of play when we were in an aggro meta, and control decks had to make the choice. Is the meta aggro enough to put in Tar Creeper, or do you skip the Tar Creeper because there's too much combo and control out there. Tar Creeper is so strong that even aggressive decks put it in their deck just to prevent other aggressive decks from killing their minions. Number five, Firefly. This little guy was the hidden jewel of, I mean, you're the mammoth, I think. Innocent enough that everyone liked the Firefly. The Firefly is like a Swiss army knife in terms of everything it can do. Partly because of the meta of having Odd Paladin around, Firefly managed to be even better than usual since there were actually a lot of 1-1s running around. Righteous Protector also, Argent Squire due to Odd Rogue. So Firefly got to get a lot of value trades in at the 1-2 stat line. Excellent turn 1 play, excellent turn 2 play, excellent turn 3 play, so much flexibility. And Rogue, you can play the Firefly or the Flame Elemental and then activate your combo with it. In Quest Rogue, you got two 4-4s, four or previously 5-5s, five for the price of just a Firefly. Incredible. Number 4. Carnivorous Cube is the poster boy of what happened in Year of the Mammoth. A lot of cheating. So Carnivorous Cube allowed you to cheat out an extra two copies of the big guy that you already previously cheated out with something like Skull of the Minari or Possessed Lackey. Or in the case of many other Death Rattle type of decks, uh, you would cube the Devil Soar Egg. Cube the result of the Devil Soar Egg, the Devil Soar. That by itself would already perhaps be pretty good, but then you added on Play Dead on Carnivorous Cube or Dark Pact on Carnivorous Cube to immediately summon the 5-7 with charges, 
Doom Guard that were coming out, which you didn't get penalized the two discards from because you pulled it out for free with your previous Lackey or with your uh, Skull of the Minari. Those are good times for Carnivorous Cube. Uh, Carnivorous Cube, of course, even strong now because uh, you actually do still just cube your egg or you cube the like Hadronox results or Hadronox itself. So yeah, that is a lot of value and a lot of cheating in a card. Number three. Victory for Gilneas. Gen Greymane. While not actually in the Year of the Mammoth, this is also rotating out alongside the Year of the Mammoth, and uh, the fact that it's rotating out this early means that you didn't even get to see Gen Greymane's full power. When it was first revealed, people were like, oh man, that's a pretty heavy restriction just to have my hero power reduced to one. Is that possibly worth it? Turns out the answer is yes. The answer is so yes that many cards uh, were also nerfed, possibly as friendly fire from Gen, possibly because they were just too strong by themselves. Flame Tongue Totem, Equality, Call to Arms. Whether or not these cards are all too strong by themselves, Gen Greymane certainly made it worse. Gen Greymane created a lot of different decks that used him, even Paladin. Even Luck, even Shaman had to think a bit about that one because uh, Flame Tongue Totem was rotated. Well, basically Hall of Fame. Number two! Truth is found in death. Prince Keliseth. Has it really been that long? Uh, yes, indeed, since Prince Keliseth came out during the first expansion, it feels like forever since Prince Keliseth has been played. And over and over again, you've seen Keliseth played on too and you've played Kaliseth on too, and your win rate has gone down slash up 5 to 10% as a result of playing this card on turn 1 or 2. Sometimes you even got to Shadow Step Kaliseth and then play him again. It was pretty ridiculous. Uh, Kaliseth was actually around when Patches was just about getting nerfed too. Sometimes you'd play Kaliseth and then your South Sea Captain and you get a 3-3 charging patches. Do you guys remember that? That was disgusting. Kaliseth is so good that even in control decks like Big Spell Mage, <laughs> a deck known for its big spells, you play Prince Kaliseth just because when you high roll and you draw Prince Kaliseth on two, it is still so strong that it's worth it. Prince Kaliseth has got to be the one of the biggest lessons that the Hearthstone design team has learned alongside Vicious Fledgling, but to a much bigger extent, that you don't want to play a card, you don't want to print a card. Prince Kaliseth has got to be one of the biggest design lessons that the Hearthstone team... Ah. Prince Kaliseth has got to be one of the biggest Hearthstone... What the heck? Prince Kaliseth has got to be one of the biggest lessons that the Hearthstone lesson team has... Prince Kaliseth has got to be one of the biggest lessons that the Hearthstone team has learned don't print a card that decides games by so much on turn two. And in fact, they learned their lesson, so they printed Gen Greymane and Baku to make sure that it was consistently powerful, and oh boy, they overstepped it a little bit still. Gen Greymane and Baku are honestly like good iterations on Prince Keliseth, it just turns out that their requirements, seeming extremely steep, uh, didn't end up being that steep given how many cards are in the format, and also the benefit is huge. And that brings us to, you know who it is. Well, no, actually. Fake out. It's the honorable mention. The honorable mention is Corpse Taker. So Corpse Taker was a nice little 4-mana 3-3 who filled in a lot of even Shaman, even Paladin decks, but also quite a number of control decks. The addition of Corpse Taker made it so that you could put in the whole Corpse Taker package, which usually involved putting in one bad Wind Fury card, one a little bit bad Lifesteal card, and then you usually had the Divine Shield and the Taunt for free. Corpse Taker really helped out in the even decks because you were able to run like four cards to fill out your deck as opposed to running more mediocre cards. And it turns out that a four mana 3 3 Divine Shield Taunt Lifesteal. Wind Fury is really good. Uh, in control decks, usually without the Wind Fury. Number one! None will survive! Finally, the top dog, to no surprise, is Baku. Baku and Gen, so strong that unprecedented, they were rotated out into the Hall of Fame after just a year because of their impact on the meta. Baku is everywhere. Odd Paladin, Odd Rogue, 
Odd Warrior, Odd Mage, of course, also a big entrant. So many different decks between aggressive decks and even control decks. It's actually kind of amazing how Baku is able to fit into both styles. There's not much to say other than it turns out that having your hero power be that powerful at the start of the game is a big deal. Hopefully this is a lesson to all of the custom Hearthstone creators also to not print ridiculous start of the game effects because when you really look at it, Baku and Gen's start of game effect isn't that insane, but even that amount of consistency and power is a lot. Now onto the class cards rotating out from Year of the Mammoth that were the most impactful. Starting with Druid, it's Spreading Plague. A little bit of a debate between Spreading Plague and Ultimate Infestation, but Spreading Plague is ultimately the thing that gets Druid to the Ultimate Infestation. Uh, it turns out that 6 mana create 530 worth of taunt value is a lot, and even if you just create two of those, like it's okay, three of those, it's really good. Uh, six of those, like you almost won the game. Aggro decks clamored for Spreading Plague to get nerfed, to get Hall of Famed. Spreading Plague was considered to be nerfed again after the nerf from five to six mana. But for you Druid players out there who are up against Odd Paladin Scum, boy did it feel good to Spreading Plague for seven on turn six. Spreading Plague bolstered the weakness of Druid, which is wide boards. Druid doesn't have much AoE, but with Spreading Plague, not really AoE. It was really like a punish to big boards, uh, to big wide boards still. For Hunter, Deathstalker Rexar. My goodness. When Deathstalker Rexar first came out, I did review it, uh, not giving it the five stars correctly, uh, saying this is the best hero, the best Death Knight, too bad Hunter sucks at the moment. Well, it turns out that Hunter later on got cards that didn't suck, and Deathstalker Rexar did in fact become the best Death Knight, providing so much value, one man infinite value machine, uh, and with the addition of lifesteal cards into the pool as well as a rush, ability to quickly deal with threats as well as gain life while doing so. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we will probably never see a card that provides as much value as Deathstalker Rexar ever again in the game. Uh, this was a lesson to the Hearthstone design team as well, and really highlighted the lack of power over the last three sets because nobody could get as much value as these Death Knights, as Deathstalker Rexar as well as the mage card, Rosslich Jaina. Similar to Deathstalker Rexar, carried control mage on her back. Uh, you had all this stall until you got your single infinite value card out. Play the Jaina if you were in, you know, not a dire situation of about to die, then you usually just won the game against anything other than a combo deck. It's cards like Jaina, which tilted the game away from mid-range decks and into control decks, and it would have been heavy control decks with all this infinite value, except that you know what beats infinite value? Combo decks. So that is where we went with these Rexars and Jaina's and all these Death Knights and infinite value decks. For Paladin, Terran. Terran, very strong card, mostly featured currently in even paladin press the button get a bunch of guys get tarim but even in not exactly even paladin just a really strong card in control paladin you saw him in the otk death knights you saw him in mid-range paladin such an incredible flexible card in that it bolsters your one ones while also reducing the power of your opponent's huge guys it's three seven taunt stat line defends against two of the opponent's three threes uh, so it would often take three of your opponent's minions to kill the Terum, since that's what you had on the board after your opponent played Terum. Really insane card. For Priest, it was Psychic Scream. Psychic Scream is perhaps the best AoE card that we have seen, with the only drawback, and it is a decent drawback, that the stuff does go back to your opponent's deck, but does not activate Death Rattles. The reason why that's a drawback is Control Priest uh, could often have the win condition of fatiguing the opponent out with the advent of Psychic Scream that was much less likely. But indeed, a 7 mana, like, just hard clear the board without even triggering death rattles 
That was insane. All control priests ran it, all combo decks ran it in order to survive. And that's not even to add that there is a major benefit that things do go back to your opponent's deck. Like, oftentimes you would shuffle a bunch of 1 1 tokens to your opponent's deck so their card draw would get nullified. For Rogue! Vile Spine Slayer. What an insane card to add on to assassinate a free. 3-4 on top of it. Now it's not quite that and some combo slash control decks ended up not running it or Kingsbane just because it was a little bit difficult to get the combo off, but needless to say, Vile Spine Slayer was so powerful, saw him a lot in Odd Rogue as well as just general any rogue. So much value all in one card. For Shaman, uh, Volcano? So, Volcano is the card that saw play in all the control or combo shamans. We didn't really see control shaman, so just pretty much in the Shutterwalk decks. Uh, the strongest card that rotates out is Volcano. Uh, that, did, that does say something about shaman. Uh, not that many strong cards rotating out. But with the AoE clear rotating out from shaman, I suspect that we're going to see some pretty good cards in the upcoming expansion and probably some sort of board clear for Shaman still too. For Warlock, Blood Reaver Gold Dawn. Warlock was a tough choice. There are some really strong cards rotating out. There's the File, there's Blood Reaver Gold Dawn, Cobalt Barbarian, Amethyst Spellstone, Void Lord, Skull of the Manai. But ultimately the decision is Blood Reaver Gold Dawn. Death Knights are ridiculous, they provide infinite value. Gold Dawn's infinite value is it keeps you alive, it eventually kills your opponent, it eventually kills all of your opponent's minions. Uh, and of course, the one-time boost when you play the Gul'dan is ridiculous. In the cube block of the past, Gul'dan could be a one-card win condition if you had already killed four of your Doom Guards, and oftentimes uh, you were threatening lethal by playing Gul'dan. But of course, since Void Lord costs nine mana by itself, if you were playing a Gul'dan, like you almost got the full Void Lord value back. Uh, just for one more mana, you are gaining the hero power and five armor. And finally for Warrior, most impactful card, and the only quest on this list, although I should at this moment mention that honorable mention to Rogue Quest as well, Caverns Below. We're comparing the cards most impactful at this moment, but Caverns Below, you know, got nerfed not once, but twice and still saw a decent amount of play. For Warrior, Fire Plume's Heart. Fire Plume's Heart is the Warrior version of infinite value of being able to kill your opponent, as well as a lot of minions with the hero power. Uh, Fire Plume's Heart got a major revival after Baku came out. It turns out that Odd Warrior is really good with being able to survive until you get Fire Plume's Heart up by being able to tank up. So upon looking at this list, uh, we can see that the Year of the Mammoth really highlighted some extremely strong cards. Cards that decided games early on, Prince Keleseth, Vicious Fledgling, pre-nerfed like, there were a lot of cards as well. Hollow Arms, <laughs> Corridor Creeper, when it was, you know, the 7 mana 5-5. Five five. Uh, many cards that cheated out cards as well, which were really impactful. Pre-nerf Possessed Lackey, uh, Skull of the Minari, Oak Heart, also a card that almost made it to the list. And then finally you had all this infinite value between Frost Lich Chaina, Blood Reaver Goldon, Deathstalker Rexar. Uh, even the quests, very strong value as well. So with those sets about to rotate out, that sets the stage for these recent expansions to shine. We haven't seen that many of them because they get overshadowed in terms of mana efficiency, in terms of power, in terms of just impact. But now they're going to be unleashed as we enter the Year of the Dragon.